All right. How's everybody doing? You ready to talk about governance? Eh? Come on, y'all. It's pretty cool. Okay, so this is not going to be the world's most technical talk, uh, but it is going to be important, I hope, um, and also engaging and informative to everybody here. Um, so if you know nothing about how the Rust project governance works, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll, you'll be a little bit uh, more up to date. But before we get started, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm Ryan. Uh, I work at Microsoft as a developer advocate, uh, focusing on Rust full time. Um, and you can find me on Twitter um, or on Zulip under Rylev. Um, and or, sorry, Twitter, Ryan underscore Levick, and GitHub and Zulip and Rylev. Unfortunately, just couldn't make it all work. Um, all right. It's also important to know who I'm not, or at least who I'm not for today. So today, I'm not going to be representing the project. I'm not talking on half of Rust project leadership. I'm just talking as me. Um, these are my ideas. But I've been talking with other people in the project a lot about this stuff. So hopefully, it's not coming from left base. Another disclaimer, because this thing needs to have lots of disclaimers in it, is that Rust project governance is in flux, um, and an RFC is currently in works. So if you're watching this in the future on a recording, hello, future, uh, some of this might not be fully correct, but that's fine. So real quick uh, raise of hands from those in the audience. Who here has ever contributed to anything under the Rust Lang GitHub organization before? All right. Quite a few people. Anybody here not done that but would maybe like to at some point? Yeah, OK. That's like basically everybody in the room. So for everybody in the room, this talk is actually pretty important to you because we're talking about governance of the Rust project. But wait, what does governance actually mean? I could give you some Wikipedia definition of governance or something like that, but I think I'll explain it like this. In the Rust project, we work on the Rust language, the Rust compiler, core tooling like Cargo, Rust up, crates.io, so on and so forth. And all of that is kind of deeply technical work, but then there's a bunch of other stuff that happens to make sure that that work can get done. And most of that is governance. We are governing the project. So I have a couple of goals for today. Some are altruistic, and others are maybe a little bit more devious. I'll start with the altruistic ones. Um, the key to good governance, to making sure that the project runs well, is accountability. And all of you in the room and out there on the internet are holding the, the project, the Rust project, accountable. But you can't just do that by screaming on Twitter. That's not a good way to do it. In order to do that, you need to be informed, informed about what governance is, what is needed for good governance, um, how governance in the Rust project actually works. And so that's the goal of today, is to inform everybody a little bit about how governance in the Rust project works. But I, I also have some slightly devious goals for today, and that's that good governance is really freaking hard. Um, and it's not always that much fun to work on, but in order to do effective governance, it takes trust and understanding between those in the project, those in the community, project members. Everybody needs to know what's going on and have a little trust and understanding that people generally are trying to do the right thing. So here's my hot take for today. At the end of the day, basically all problems in the Rust project are governance problems. So we're just talking about problems on problems on problems today. Unfortunately, we won't really get into solutions. That's for another talk. Um, but I'd love to talk to you about solutions afterwards as well. So let's talk a little bit about the status quo. What does governance of the Rust project look like today? I'm sure not everybody in here is familiar with the, the intricacies of Rust's uh, governance model. So we'll take a look at the current structure. We have teams in the Rust project that are in charge of certain things. They have their purview. For instance, the Lang team or the language team. They are in charge of the Rust language. So at the end of the day, they're the ones that decide what gets into the language and what is not a part of, of Rust. Now, this happens through community involvement, RFCs. Has anybody here opened an RFC to change the language itself before? Yeah, we have a few people here. So, And that is a, a community-driven uh, process, but 
At the end of the day, it's the Lang team that decides whether to say yes or say no. And the Lang team can have subteams that are involved with it. So, for instance, a newly formed team is the style team. The style team is an offshoot of what was uh, Rust format. Rust format continues to exist as the tool, but the style team now makes all those fun bike shedding decisions of how to actually style Rust. What are the rules for styling Rust that Rust format will go ahead and implement? And the Lang team can have several other teams and does have several other subteams. And there are a lot of other teams like Lang. Then there are teams like the DevTools team, which in and of itself is not incredibly active. It's more there to group a bunch of teams together. Um, so we have teams like Rust Format, Rust Up, and, uh, and Cargo that fall underneath DevTools. Um, and DevTools acts as sort of an umbrella bringing those teams together and ensuring a little bit of consistency across all the various DevTools that the Rust project offers. And then you have teams like the core team. Uh, I'm a member of the, the core team. Um, and uh, what the core team is supposed to do is provide support to the other teams. So if for those who are not familiar with Rust, you may have thought, well, isn't all of this the core team? No, and the Rust project, the core team is a sort of support structure, and all the other teams are, um, are core teams to the project, but are not the core team themselves. Hopefully, we'll make that a little less confusing in the future. And then, in addition to teams, you have, ACE, you have uh, working groups, and these working groups are sort of in charge of domains that are not specific to the Rust project, but are some kind of collection of things that you do with Rust. For instance, the async working group is a working group that works on the async programming model in, in Rust. And these, these working groups have kind of looser ties to various teams. Uh, for instance, the async working group has a connection to the Lang team. They make suggestions to the Lang team, maybe even open RFCs and things like that. And of course, the Lang team then makes decisions about what actually gets into the, the language. And all of this all together forms the Rust project. Um, so when we talk about the Rust project, you can think of it as a collection of, the te of teams that are working on the language, the compiler, um, and various core tooling. And sort of supporting all of that is the Rust Foundation. Um, so the Rust Foundation and the Rust Project are two separate entities from it, which is, differs from some other uh, open source communities. Um, and the foundation is in charge of sort of financial and legal support for the project. And what I've painted here is kind of the neatest version of all that. There's a whole bunch of complexity and kind of messiness um, that we'll touch on a little bit today that makes some of this a little less confusing or a little more confusing in practice. So what are the pros and cons of the way that we currently do governance uh, in Rust? Well, we have autonomous teams in Rust, which is a really great thing. These teams can be in charge of their own section of the project and, and work on that relatively independent of each other. They don't have to go to some centralized authority um, to, to get kind of say on whether something is OK or not. So for instance, the Lang team or the compiler team get to work on their section of the project and get to, be, and get to own their section of the project. And what this means is that this promotes ownership by experts. So those who are closest to what they're working on are the ones who actually own that thing. And this also means there's no single point of failure. So if one team kind of goes off the rails and does something that they shouldn't do, that doesn't mean that the entire project falls down. It just means that we have one section that's not working like it should. And with this, we have a low amount of overhead. Um, we don't have to do a ton of coordination between things, so everything can move quickly um, and, and easily. And at the end of the day, it prevents consolidation of power, which is always a, a, a tricky thing to talk about in open source. Um, but you know, sometimes people want to have ideas for something, and they want to take it a certain way. Our governance uh, system makes sure that no one really can do that. Um, we are all in this together. But there are some cons to how we do things. This is all kind of messy and hard to understand. Again, the picture I painted before is sort of the best version of reality. Um, at the end of the day, some teams and some working groups don't have clear relationships with each other. It's hard to coordinate. Uh, each team is moving independently, and sometimes they don't talk to each other even when they should. You end up repeating work between teams because, because each team is working independently. They might have 
problems that are similar between uh, themselves, but they don't really talk and solve those problems together. They each individually solve those problems. That's not really great. And this all makes cross-domain work harder. So it means that when some problem needs to involve multiple teams, it ends up not really involving them or makes working these teams working together a bit, a bit harder. And at the end of the day, this favors work done by what I like to call heroes or motivated individuals. So kind of between teams, you have several people on the project who are, have just been there a long time and seemingly have eight days a week and 30 hours a day to work on Rust. Um, and they do a lot of work, but that's not good. That's not good because it leads to burnout. It leads to kind of knowledge siloing where a few individuals are having an outsized impact instead of being able to share uh, in that impact with others. All right, so the status quo of Rust governance is that in general, Rust has a solid base. I'm not here to tell you that Rust is about to fail tomorrow. That's not the case. Um, we have a solid base of, for governance in the project, um, but the strength of that governance is within teams. So each team is doing a pretty good job of understanding how to best do their job, but across teams, we could be doing so much better. Um, and hopefully in the future, we will be doing better at that. So now I'm going to go through several situations, sort of uh, kind of play along and see what you would do in these situations, how you think Rust's governance model should handle certain things. So the first situation we're going to talk about is a compiler change. A member of the compiler team wants to change how some internal piece of the compiler works. Well, what happens? Let's talk about the decision here. This decision impacts the compiler team and not really anyone else. Of course, you know, if there's a bug or something like that, it will impact everybody. But how the compiler is organized, um, how it's factored, that's a compiler team decision. They don't really need to involve others in that decision-making process. Because at the end of the day, it's usually pretty reversible. Um, if somebody makes a mistake in how they factor the compiler, they probably can reverse it, even though it's not always easy in practice. Um, and this is like squarely in the charter of the compiler team. The compiler team is in charge of the compiler, so if there's a decision that only involves how the compiler is built, it's the compiler's team decision. And there's a whole process for how this is handled in, uh, in, in actual practice that I won't get into today, um, but you can look at the compiler team repo um, for more information about that. But what about a language uh, feature here? So someone wants to propose a new language feature. How is that decided? Well, this decision makes, uh, it impacts the entire community, right? Everybody here, even if you're not involved in the project, really cares about what gets into the language and what doesn't. But it's still squarely in the Lang team's charter. They, they were formed in order to make these types of decisions. And it's not really reversible. Once something gets into the language, backwards compatibility means we can't take it out. So these are high stakes questions here. And it needs broad buy-in. So if everybody in this room, even if you're not on the Lang team, hates the decision, then it's probably a bad decision from the Lang team. But this also means that it gets a lot of engagement from the community. So if you've ever been involved in an RFC for a language feature, especially a very controversial one, like, for instance, async await went on forever and ever and ever, then you know that this can be sometimes incredibly overwhelming. But now let's focus on a couple of, of situations where it's not so clear. What we've talked about so far is kind of the best case. We have that handled. This is the core of what we do in the Rust project, and we do it pretty well. That's good. But what happens when you have something like a licensing issue? So a contributor opens a PR that adds support for a proprietary game system. And this change might violate patent law, could get actually the Rust project in legal trouble. What happens then? Well, something about this decision. This decision is technical. It has to do with adding support into a compiler, but it's also legal as well. And I don't know, I don't believe there are any lawyers involved in the, the Rust project, or at least on the compiler team. But it impacts the entire project. So if something goes wrong here, this could put Rust itself in jeopardy. And it's not really reversible. If, so if you bring the, the change into the compiler and then somebody says, whoops, that was not actually legal to do, well, you know, it's kind of past, and we might still face the consequences. And most people probably don't really care about this. Like, you know, if you're not building, I don't know, uh, games for the Nintendo Switch or something like that, then you don't really care, you know, whether there's support for that in the compiler or not. But some people 
really, really, really care, like so much that they might get very angry if something doesn't go their way. And this brings me to my first law of governance. Most people don't care about governance until they really, really, really care about governance. And that's the challenge at the end of the day, is making sure that when everything is going fine, you do the right thing, and you don't end up in situations where you have people beating down your door. So who makes this decision then? Does the compiler team make this decision? What about the legal requirements that are caused here? Like I said, nobody on the compiler team is a, is a lawyer, as far as I'm aware. How do others in the project uh, ensure that these issues are raised properly at all? And what is the process for raising concerns uh, about this decision? These are all kind of open questions that we're not, we have processes for, but frankly, they're not really robust or, or very good. And so we're still trying to figure this out in, a, in an ad hoc way. And that's not always the best. At the end of the day, ensuring accountability without having conflict can be very difficult. So we want to make sure the right thing is done, but we also, it's hard to tell people, hey, you messed up. Let's move on to something like a trademark policy. So trademarks can be used to ensure that when somebody says the name Rust, that they know what they're talking about. That if, they, if somebody's referring to Rust, they're not referring to a refrigerator or something like that. They're referring to the programming language. Um, so what is the project's policy for enforcing trademarks? The decision here, again, impacts the entire community. It's kind of core to the question of what is Rust? And that feels like a very important question, right? What is Rust is something that we really should have a handle on. But it's not really urgent, right? We don't have a ton of people kind of knocking down our door and saying, you, we you know, want to use the name Rust. What's the, the trademark policy? Although that's changing with each day. And so at the end of the day, who makes this decision about what the trademark policy is? A lot of people in the project are too busy to do the urgent work that the project needs. So what about this non-urgent work? And in fact, if we get to a point where we actually really do need a trademark policy, it's probably already too late. We should have had one to begin with. And it's not really in the charter of any existing team, except for core, but even then, it's not really kind of, we're not really sure how to handle stuff like that. And this kind of brings me to my second law of governance here. The hardest problems in governance are the important ones that are not urgent. And these end up kind of sitting there until it's too late and you end up having issues. Okay, let's move on to a collaboration issue, an issue with a project member who's not violating the code of conduct. So this is not a, a, a contributor who's doing something really horrible, but they're just frankly not that great to work with. They might exhaust others. They don't have the best style of collaboration. This decision is tough because it's sensitive and draining. It's hard to tell other people, you're just not that fun to work with, right? It's often easier to just avoid conflict. Well, I don't like working with person X, so I'll just go work on something else. And that's also not really great. We should be professional in the Rust project. We should be able to give each other feedback, be constructive, make others in the project better, make ourselves better. But who has the authority to comment on someone's behavior? If I tell you that you're not that fun to work with, you might go, who the heck are you to say that? That's not very nice. I'm here as a volunteer. And really, at the end of the day, we do all of our work in public, or most of our work in public, and this can encourage bullying. So if somebody's not that fun to work with, and I say, ah, they're not that fun to work with, and then 500 other people say, yeah, they're a real asshole, that's, that's not good, right? That's probably too much of a response for what that person actually did. So we have to figure out a way to give feedback in a constructive way that doesn't end up making people feel terrible or actually be the targets of online harassment. So who makes the decision about how to handle this? We have a moderation team, but this isn't code of conduct violation. It's something much more subtle. And we need to coordinate these efforts so that we don't end up dogpiling on this person. And there's not really training out there. This is something that open source in general really struggles with. So how do we get better? It's the same issue as most quote unquote non-technical work uh, in the project. Folks are volunteering usually for technical reasons. They want to hack on the compiler. They want to work on cargo. They want to think about language changes and stuff. They don't normally contribute to open source 
to manage people or to help with people problems. But there's a whole heck of a lot of people problems in the Rust project. We need more people who can do this stuff, but we don't really welcome them into the project as much as we should. All right, what about getting input from, to, to the foundation? So the foundation needs project input on some public initiative that they're working on, maybe with some sponsorship money or something like that. And this project has project-wide consequences. It will affect the Rust project as a whole. So identifying stakeholders here is really, really hard. Who does the foundation actually talk to? Who's in charge of the thing? Who must be consulted? The, the foundation can do the, try to do the right thing and talk to as many people as possible, but it would be really nice to be able to tell the foundation staff, these are the stakeholders that must be consulted on this decision. And sometimes that's hard to answer when the governance layout is not so clear. So who makes this decision? This really strikes at the heart of who speaks for the project. Who is Rust? What people are Rust? And certain decisions also have this. Who is the language team? Who is in charge of the language? Who is in charge of the compiler? Who's in charge of Rust Up? Who's in charge of the trademark policy? So what does Rust governance need then? Well, we need to keep some things. We want to keep independent and autonomous teams. We want some centralized leadership so that uh, work that spans across the project has a place to go and be thought about. We need this to keep flexibility that we have. And we want to have as little bureaucracy as possible. Because, you know, who wants to spend their time working in a bureaucratic mess? I certainly don't. But we need a lot more of some things. We need more cross-team collaboration. We need more accountability. We need more explicit structures so that folks that are new to the project actually know what the heck is going on and don't have to spend a year figuring it out. And we need better separation of technical skill from project management skill. Everybody who is here today who is involved in Rust is a technical person. But some people are less good at project management and some are better. And we're not doing the best job of attracting people with good project management skills. And above all, we want this to be approachable so that the folks at the beginning of this talk who hadn't raised their hand when I asked who has contributed to Rust before feel like they have an easier time of doing that in the future. So what do we keep? We want to keep independent autonomous teams. We want to maintain this flexibility and we want little bureaucracy. And what do we need more of? We need more cross-team collaboration, more accountability, and a more understandable structure. But there are plenty of failure modes that we could run into here. We could just, frankly, not find people who are excited about working on project management or administrative work. That's not always a given. We might lack accountability for our leadership. We might have project leadership that's detached from the problems of the project, which is not great as well. And we might end up with a leadership that's overwhelmed with the problems of the project and feel like they don't have the support that they need in order to work through those issues. We might lack delegated authority. This is sort of related to the previous point where we don't end up giving others the say in what they're working on and we try to centralize that decision making in a few small people. That's not good. We might lack some transparency. And this is my third law of governance. Everyone, literally everyone, including myself, underestimates how hard transparency is. Transparency sounds great. It's a, a lofty goal to aim towards but it is hard to do right. Because at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff is subtle, requires context, and Twitter or Reddit is not a great place to discuss subtlety or complexity. We might lack or have underspecified processes and policies in order to do the right thing. We might, have, you know, we might end up changing decisions that have already been delegated, which would kind of undermine the whole process. We might end up having leadership as a popularity contest where the person with the kind of loudest voice or, or best tutorial of Rust uh, on the internet ends up being declared leader because they're popular, not because they're the best person for the job. And we might end up with diffusion of responsibility. And this is the thing that I'm most worried about, and the thing that I see the most today. Diffusion of responsibility means that if no one is in charge of something, then it simply just won't get done. And that might not hurt today, it might not hurt tomorrow, 
but it could hurt really, really badly in the future. So I want to give a whole lot of thanks to everybody here for listening to a talk about open source governance. You did it. Thank you very much. I also want to thank everybody in the Rust project, leaders in the Rust project who uh, were happy with me giving this presentation and representing some of the views uh, of that leadership. I um, want to thank uh, my employer for letting me be here. Um, and of course, uh, thank you to, to the audience. You, you guys were great. Thank you.